You are now listening to Shia, the era of our female-led society, an audiobook series written by T. Erica, the Oracle, presented by female-led society.org. Chapter 1. It is now year 23, 23 years after the birth of our new world, 23 years after women won the right to unobstructed leadership. The world calendar reset that year and there were no complaints. Every person alive at that point recognized that our world had experienced an unheralded rebirth and nothing would ever be the same. The annual meeting of the Shias is underway. Shia means powerful feminine ruler. There are eight Shias who share leadership of the new world. Seven of the Shias are each responsible for leading a continent, which we now call communities. Seven communities form our one world nation, which is led by the eighth Shia, the Shia Supreme. Her name is Glory. Glory is a vibrant, brave woman. Her tight curls are often braided back, forming a halo on her head. A former elementary school teacher from Miami turned vigilante Glory led the transition to form our female-led society. A single scar above her right eye serves as a clear reminder of the battle she fought and won. As she is supreme, Glory oversees and supports the leadership of the seven communities she is. She is there to offer wisdom, inspire courage, and to ensure that every Shia upholds the 15 principles of feminine power. Glory has reigned as Shia Supreme since the inception of our female-led society 23 years ago. Her vision reorganized the world and the benefits of our female-led society have provided a sense of relief and peace that has never been experienced before. The seven community Shias were chosen by the Shia Supreme for their exceptional achievements in leadership. Shia Europe is destiny. The dark-haired former CEO who led her company to the top of the Fortune 500 list where they remained for five years. Destiny is an unyielding leader who promises results and always achieves. Shia Australia is Jenna, the former human rights strategist who created a model for unskilled workers that gave them value and solidified their role in our society. Jenna is a vivacious siren who believes femininity is power. As a former criminal justice reformer, Reese is Shia America. Reese led the redevelopment of our law enforcement and policing practices to ensure justice and true equality for all. A former judge and women's rights activist, Shia Antarctica is Raquel. Raquel created and facilitated an aggressive rehabilitation program for men convicted of abusing women that reduced recidivism by 95%. Shia Africa is Anika, the famed Peace Corps director who led a team that recovered more than a thousand victims of sex trafficking in third world countries in just one year. Shia Asia is Sunny, a former urban designer who integrated agriculture, education, and design to transform neglected urban neighborhoods into top tier communities without displacing the original residents. Shia Sur America is Magdalene, better known as Brainy. 
Brainy is a former economist who gained notoriety for completing a study that proved access to education directly affected the probability of poverty. She then implemented an educational program in Bolivia that decreased the poverty level of a single village by 80% in one year. Her program has been duplicated in villages across Bolivia, revitalizing its economic base. These feminine powers combined, pledging to uphold the 15 principles of feminine power and share in a devoted love for humanity, have laid the groundwork for an astonishingly progressive future. At this point, all eight Shias have arrived for the annual meeting in a secret location for a week of rejuvenation as they review the progress of the last year. The women discussed pitfalls and strategies that worked well as they led their respective communities. The annual meeting is held in a compound in the middle of an unnamed forest. The meeting site is a temporary haven constructed solely for this annual meeting and will be torn down when the meeting is done. There are multiple buildings dotting the clearing, manicured grounds, and lavish amenities. Each Shia was flown there without knowledge of its exact location for their safety and protection. The all-male staff attend to the grounds and wait for instructions to take care of any needs that may arise. Armed guards maintain the premises, led by Pierre, the head of security for the annual meeting, and one of the most decorated men in the Special Forces, the Worldwide Military and Disaster Relief Team. By midday, the eight women bathe together as a cleansing ritual. They then pray together in silence, clad in the finest robes made of silk. Devoted male attendants serve them without hesitation, offering massages, pedicure, food, and loving admiration. Each woman offers a presentation about her community's progress, a recap of the highs, lows, and milestones achieved. Each woman is there to share the progress of her community and to ask for help or to offer it if necessary. The discussion following each presentation is heartfelt. The women all know each other very well, having worked together to avert crisis and come to each other's aid many times in the past three years. Each community Shia will hold office for a 10 year term, just enough time to guide her social reforms and witness her community flourish under her leadership. This is currently year three of their 10 year term. Each of the Shias are growing comfortably into their roles as community leaders yet each woman is aware that in the coming year, a new Supreme Shia will be chosen from among them to take her place as the next world leader. There will be no campaigning for the position. Glory, the current Supreme Shia, has total authority to choose who will succeed her. The women prepare for the evening's rest and they all climb into a giant circular bed adorned with fluffy pillows and blankets and a rainbow of colors. The giant bed rests in the center of a large tent with a skylight and screens to protect them from outside elements. The night sky is visible through the side panels of the tent screens and the sound of crickets can be heard nearby, soothing the women. The male attendants retire as the women wind down for bed under the stars. The ritual of anti-sanctimonious revelation begins. During this ritual, each of the women offers an emotional confession of something they feel may not have aligned with their highest potential. Shia Destiny admits that she has had feelings of depression. Shia Jenna offers that she lied about her health and was not feeling as vibrant as she claimed. Shia Reese offers a confession of jealousy toward the younger women in her office. Shia Raquel shares that she wants more children but believes her position is taking so much of her time that she will never be able to. Shia Anika confesses a growing resentment toward her mother. Shia Brainy confesses that she favored a friend during a dispute when it was clear that the friend was wrong. When the time comes for Glory to share, she takes a deep breath before she admits that she has been experiencing feelings of fear. I forgive you, I forgive you, I love you. Each woman says aloud to herself, 
and to the others eight times before drifting off to sleep. I forgive you. I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I love you. The next morning, the morning alarm is a comforting melody that gradually becomes louder. The eight Shias awaken to the sight of the sun shining through the tent screens. The world seems perfect at this moment as each woman exchanges morning greetings, still cozy in the giant bed. Pierre, the head of security for the annual meeting, steps inside the tent. Ma'am, he speaks softly yet urgently to Glory, the Shia Supreme. Yes, Pierre, Glory responds as she stands and pulls on her robe, assisted by an attendant. The other women follow suit, rubbing the sleep from their eyes. I have just received word that this location may have been compromised. Glory is shocked as the other women look around them. Compromised, Glory asks. Our forces detect movement nearby and they are not from our camp. We have the plane waiting. No time to get dressed. We have to get you ladies out of here. Is this a joke? Reese asks. No, ma'am. Sorry about this. We will handle it. We just need you to all come before Pierre completes the sentence. A gunshot rings out. Pierre falls to the ground and the women gasp and scramble to shield glory from harm. A male voice can be heard in the distance. Hello, princess. It's time we have a little talk. Let them leave, Glory instructs firmly, glancing around the perimeter to see who is speaking to her. The voice seems to be coming from different angles. When there is no response, she motions for the seven women to leave the tent. They scramble out of the tent and across the field. Who are you? Glory questions, her eyes darting from one end of the tent to the other. A man steps out of the shadows and Glory turns to face him. He wears a black coat black pants and a gray scarf. He wears a black hat. His eyes are black. You've seen me before. Don't you remember? He says. She had seen him before. A few times. Flashbacks to seeing him as she's walking down the street. Flashback to seeing him at her wedding. Flashback after her car's accident. Glory thought that she had imagined him. She hesitates. What do you want? I'm here to introduce myself formally. I am Galvin. I have been keeping tabs on you for a very long time. You've done well for yourself. You managed to pull off restructuring our entire society, a feat that no man could have ever done. You should be proud. What do you want? Glory asks defiantly. I want you to know that your reign is not indefinite. I have allowed you to have your fun, but we will return this world to its rightful place. You will have to kill me, Glory challenges him. What fun would that be? Winning means nothing without a worthy opponent. You have proven yourself to be worthy, but your time is limited. Bitch, please. Hmm. Just like a woman, Galvin says and steps over Pierre's dead body turning away from glory as he walks towards the exit. Stand down, Tigress. I have methods you cannot control or predict. And tighten your security. Shameful. Galvin steps outside of the tent. Immediately, there's a rustling noise behind glory. She turns around to see the seven women force their way in, armed with guns. Are you okay? Sunny asks as her eyes scan the room. The seven women surround Glory with their backs toward her, to guard her. Who was it? Reese asks. Flashbacks of Galvin walking down the street. Flashbacks of Galvin at her wedding. Flashbacks of Galvin after her car accident. Flashback of him standing in front of her today. A man with a death wish. And he will surely get his wish, Glory remarks clenching her fist and then motioning for the women to relax and drop their weapons. The forces? Glory asks with a look of disgust. They have been dismissed and detained, Brainy assures her. The second wave is on the way.